just to confirm you are now live. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good evening everybody, I'm David Williams, Chief Executive Portsmouth City Council and Gosport Borough Council. Just introducing this meeting of the Partnership for South Hampshire Joint Committee. Uh, we have a number of elected members um, on the committee who I will invite to introduce themselves in a moment. We also have a number of guests and speakers for various items on the agenda who I will ask to introduce themselves as they first speak or introduce their items. Thank you. So in terms of the agenda, the first item is the election of chairman. And the first thing I would like to do is just check that all the, all the voting members are present can hear the proceedings and can see the proceedings. So first of all, Councillor Sean Woodward, Fair and Borough Council. Yes, I'm here and I can hear you and see you. Thank you. Councillor Gerald Vernon Jackson, Portsmouth City Council. How did I know? Councillor Keith House, Eastley Borough Council. Well, I'm here and can see everyone, even if Gerald can't. Thank you. Councillor Stephen Philpot, Gosport Borough Council. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, David. Councillor Judith Grajowski, Hampshire County Council. We do know that Judith is trying to join the meeting, so I'm sure she will be with us um, shortly. Councillor Michael Wilson, Haven't Borough Council. Hello, Chair. Present. Thank you. May I interrupt? Count yes, I am here. Thank you. Splendid. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, Councillor Neil Cutler, Winchester City Council. Uh, yes, I'm here and can see and hear everything. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Edward Heron, New Forest District Council. I am here and can see and hear everything. Thank you. Councillor Adams King, Test Valley Borough Council. Uh, Yes, I'm here and can hear and see you all. And Patrick Heenahan from New Forest uh, National Park. Yes, I'm here and uh, can see and hear perfectly well. Thank you. Can I just check that we have nobody in the meeting, uh, um, elected member representing, first of all, East Hampshire? Uh, Councillor Moon sent his apologies, David. Thank you very much. And Southampton City Council. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Christopher Hammond has unfortunately at the last minute had to be called into the office. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll now proceed with the election of chairman, item one on your agenda. Can I please ask for any nominations for the chairman for the municipal year 2021? Councillor Adams King. Councillor Adams King, you're muted at the moment. Got me now? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, 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 propose Councillor Woodward as chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Keith House, you're indicating. Yeah, I'll happily second Sean Woodward to continue as chair. Thank you. Any other nominations? No. Okay, if you could indicate all in favour, please, if you show your hands or just go into the chat. Splendid. 
Thank you very much. Congratulations, Councillor Woodward. You have been duly elected as Chair of the Partnership for South Hampshire. And I'll hand over the agenda to you, item two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, David. And thank you to the members for my first virtual election. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, could, could I ask as a general rule, because if everybody has anyway, but would you please keep yourselves muted unless um, you're wanting to speak. It looks as if the hand up function is working. When you put your hand up, please could you take it down? Thank you, Judith, for doing that. Uh, once, you've, once you've been called, otherwise I might call you twice and, and that would never do. So th thank you again. Uh, welcome to any members of the public who happen to be watching us. And of course, we do have a, a deputy who I'll be calling later and the officers who will be presenting as well. May, might I also ask, because it will help uh, me to see people as well, if um, just the elected members would keep their video cameras on and everybody else could switch the videos off and that will make it, I think, a bit easier to run the meeting. And of course, when an officer, you know, if you are speaking, obviously, please put your camera on and similarly to the deputies. And I think it would just help members because we only get a maximum of nine faces to admire and uh, I'm sure politicians would like to look at politicians wherever they can. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll now move to uh, item two, which is the appointment of vice chairman. I think in, in his absence, uh, I'd like to propose Christopher Hammond again, leader of Southampton City Council. Uh, ask first if that has a seconder. Let's see, I'm looking for any hands who might want to second. Thank I you, Nick. I saw that. Thank you, Nick Adams King has seconded. Are there any other nominations? I'm not seeing any movement, so I'll declare therefore that uh, Councillor Christopher Hammond in, is in absentia, is the Vice Chairman of the Partnership for South Hampshire. Now move to item three on the agenda. And that's apologies and any changes in the joint committee membership. I have apologies first from some chief executive officers, from Peter Grimwood from Fairham and Richard Jolly as deputising, Jill Neller from Haventon East Hampshire, David Hayward as the deputy, Nick Tustian from Eastley and Natalie Wigman is with us, Oliver Crosswaite Air from the New Forest National Park and Patrick Hennigan is with us, Alison Barnes from New Forest National Park. Christopher Hammond from Southampton and Ken Moon from East Hampshire. Are there any other apologies? Please shout now. Not seeing any. So now move to item four, which is the minutes of the previous meeting held way back on the 10th of February. Uh, it's probably easiest to do this is ask sort of negative resolutions on these. So does anybody have a problem with me signing the minutes? I take that as a no, so therefore I'm taking the minutes as agreed. Uh, chairman's announcements, I don't have any this evening. Uh, second item six is declarations of interest. Does anybody have any declarations of interest? Again, I'm not seeing any of those, which moves us straight into item seven, which is deputations. So we have D Huss, who I'm really pleased to welcome from the uh, CPRE, and D is going to make a deputation relating to item eight on tonight's agenda, which is the statement of common ground. She's going to do that by way of presentation. So I hope that that will work successfully as well. Uh, and then um, we'll then move to debate to have our officers report and debate item eight. So Dee, if you'd like to start and you have up to 10 minutes and I'll be advised if it looks like you're getting near it. Thank you, Sean. I am just going to get my, I'm um, just trying to get the right thing up on. I think this is probably the one. Right. Can you see CPRE Hampshire, South Hampshire Greenbelt on your screen? Yes, I can, so I'm guessing everyone else can. Hooray. Okay. So, um, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting us um, to make this presentation. I am the chair of CPRE Hampshire, the countryside charity. Um, last time we presented uh, to this, hang on a moment, I'm just going to, um, right, okay, we're good. Uh, okay, last time 
we presented to this group, we had collected 14,000 signatures on a petition to establish a green belt in South Hampshire. We believe this to be the only currently available effective way to prevent urban sprawl and coalescence, coalescence between towns and cities. This petition is still growing and we know that there is a strong public support. Uh, we still strongly believe that the exceptional circumstances needed for the designation of a green belt exist here in South Hampshire and we established last time we met that strategic gaps policies have been ineffective in safeguarding open space from creeping development. One thing that came out of our petition was the strong feeling that the public have all through South Hampshire towards the green spaces on their doorsteps. People depend on the countryside for their mental and physical well-being. The coronavirus pandemic, of course, has emphasised this more than ever. To demonstrate that these areas of countryside actually have a financial value as well, in 2019, we commissioned NEF Consulting, part of the UK think tank New Economics Foundation, to write a report exploring the socio-economic and environmental value of the Green Belt. The report looks into three elements, health and well-being, the economy, including recreation, the value of nature and ecosystems. It was important to, all, to us, as well as the authors, that the report should be based on independent research. It is therefore based on academic and government data sources, all referenced in the study. They used the area of search which CPRE Hampshire identified as potential green belt. Uh, the area studied is around 20,000 hectares or 49,500 acres. The coronavirus lockdown has highlighted the importance of access to green spaces. There has been a surge of appreciation for the countryside. Although these findings are specific to this area, they are relevant to any area of countryside. The main message is that the countryside is not just somewhere to put development, but it has a quantifiable value in its own right. So the results of the study show in under health and well-being benefits, up to £17 million per year in health and well-being benefits for those living in the proposed green belt and its periphery. Um, it saves the NHS up to £690,000 per year in fewer GP visits. And in two generations times, so that's 60 years, up to £452 million in health and well-being benefits can be gleaned from the Green Belt area. Economic benefits from tourism and recreation. These benefits are based on the recreational use of the area, cycling, fishing, horse riding, running and walking. Tourism and recreation have positive benefits to local communities, jobs for local people, conservation of habitats and wildlife, the preservation of rural services, increased demands for local goods, increased income for rural businesses. These benefits add up to £1.7 million per year, or in two generations time, £35 million. Natural Capital and Ecosystem Services. In January 2020, the government produced new guidance on natural capital, which this report is based on. Our budget for the report has limited the number of ecosystem services that can be calculated, so the result is a very conservative one. Um, if we'd had more money to pay NEF Consulting more, we would have, uh, we could perhaps have produced a, a greater amount of money, but they've been very conservative and only based it on what they've been able to actually prove. So we can, uh, ecosystem services are categorized as provisioning, number one, food, timber and water. In this study, only food from agriculture is included. 
Uh, number two is regulating. This includes air pollution, flood mitigation, carbon sequestration, which of course is the big one for climate change. Those are included. And supporting services, not included here, but the main one that we would want to look into is the, is the cycling of nutrients. Um, number four is cultural services, the non-use value, e.g. the value of knowing habitats are there. So the services included in this report are providing food, improving air quality, removing pollution, flood protection, non-use value of biodiversity, and carbon sequestration, which helps to tackle climate change. So the value of just some of the ecosystems provided by the Greenbelt area is up to £7.6 million a year. In two generations time, the value of just some of the ecosystem services is £192 million. So the combined value is as much as £26 million per year in terms of health, well-being, economic and ecosystem benefits. This would be significantly more if all ecosystem services had been investigated. In two generations' time, the combined net present value could produce well in excess of half a billion pounds. Um, in December 2018, the Joint Committee made a resolution for the rationale and justification for an appropriate Greenbelt designation to be included as a core part of any joint work taken forward under the duty to cooperate initiative. Our deputation today is to ask how the Green Belt is being progressed as it is not mentioned in the Common Ground Update report. Our concern is that Green Belt designation could be left behind if not progressed synchronous, synchronously with the Common Ground work. So in conclusion, we have a once in a generation opportunity to have a significant impact on the environment in South Hampshire. We know now that strategic gaps don't work. We know that the public are behind the idea and we know that by not developing on greenfield land, we are saving millions. The people in this room have the power to make it happen. It won't be easy, but it will be a legacy for generations to come. Thank you for listening, everybody. If you have any questions, I and my colleagues, Caroline Dibden and Steve Lees, are here to help you. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Dee, for your presentation. Uh, it is a deputation, so we, you know, yeah. we, don't, we don't question it. We, we listen to you, and obviously we'll be taking it into account in the item that we're coming to on as the next item on the agenda. So thank you very much indeed, and uh, we're we'll very welcome to, I hope you will remain with us. Um, so, I will do, thank you. Yeah. Right, so we're now going to move on to uh, have a brief um, presentation of the report to us. So the Statement of Common Ground item, we're now on to item eight, and that's Claire Upton-Brown, who's the chairman of the PUSH Planning Officers Group, and Mike Allgrove, who is uh, our PUSH consultant. So over to you, uh, Claire, to just uh, update us or say anything you need to on the report. Thank you. Um, I won't repeat the content of the report. The report is for noting that, um, Trinity, uh, just to make you aware, within the report we have highlighted that there will be a need to revisit the common ground and the timetable. And it's envisaged because of the delays that have occurred in procuring consultants that the original of January 2021 for the conclusion of, of studies to come back to the Joint Committee will need to be extended. It's our anticipation that we will be in a position to bring you back a revised draft to the next Joint Committee in September. Chair, other than that, the report is for noting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Claire. So we'll move over to members now. I think it would be appropriate, though, just to answer the point that Dean did make in the CPRE deputation, and that was about Greenbelt not being mentioned in this brief update report, but I would refer members back to last October's G20 
joint committee uh, where we did agree a timetable. Now, accepting that timetable is going to slip, but just to make it very clear that the green infrastructure needs and consideration of mechanisms on how to achieve green belt designation were uh, a part of that. And it started off in quarter three, which was looking at establishing the green infrastructure needs. And then quarter four, considering options for the policy approach for scope and procuring landscape assessment. And then into quarter one of the of next year, undertaking assessments and considering options. And in quarter three, reviewing evidence and determining approach to green belt designation. So I just want to make it very clear, it has not been lost. It's just this is a brief update today on it, but that work has not certainly not disappeared. So, would any members like to ask any questions or make any comments on this item? If you do, please raise your hand or send me a message. I'm looking intently and I'm not seeing any hands or any messages, which I guess, uh, ah, now I am. Michael Wilson, the leader of Haven. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, that uh, deputation was very interesting, and I obviously remember back to the meeting in October. But uh, the, I suppose the issue that crossed my mind reading the papers is how this squares with the NPPF, and uh, particularly paragraph 135, which deals with the issue of Greenbelt and the fact that uh, it should only really be considered in exceptional circumstances. And uh, I suppose the, the issue for us is how, whilst we're all uh, to ensure that we do have green space and protect uh, areas, particularly since the pandemic, when we know how important, or we're reminded again how important they are to residents. But of course, with the NPPF, we have other considerations such as the, the uh, impact that it would have on sustainable development and also the, the government's uh, prescribed housing need for our area. And I note that obviously Wellbourne, which is uh, close to the chairman's heart, will, uh, was included in, the, uh, in that uh, report. And uh, of course, without Wellbourne in particular, for an example, uh, where would we all be in terms of meeting our needs? Thank, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, look, I was, I, I did actually have a, a close look at the New Economics Foundation report, which um, CPRE had commissioned, uh, which, which was quite interesting. But I did note, for example, that the area, the area of search for the green belt, does appear to include Wellborn, which was a bit, uh, a bit odd. Although, of course, it does exclude much of Fair and Borough from it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think there's probably a little bit of work maybe needs doing on there. And the report does, while it's making its economic conclusions on the economic value of a green belt, does also ex um, assume that every, you know, the comparison is with every inch of that proposed green belt being built upon. And of course, that um, I'm sure would not be the case in, in any event under any scenario. So, you know, I think we do, you know, it's probably, I hope CPRE would agree too, there needs to be a bit of caution, I think, in interpreting that report uh, because of the things on which, on which it, it has been based. As I say, assuming, it also assumes the whole area could be accessed via public rights of way and open access land and says the number of visits a year will be 189,000 and then uses a Sport England study to quantify the financial benefits but it doesn't actually recognise the existing tourism value of the area. So and it seems to present the figures in gross terms. So, you know, it, it's, uh, I say it's an interesting report, but it's something that perhaps we need to look at in a bit more detail in the future. Uh, well, one other thing, though, just possibly worth saying, I'd be interested in Claire's views on it, but um, the, we're working now on, on the fair and local plan, and I know that a number of colleagues have been working on local plans in their own areas. But there are indications from the evidence to support the designation we're using now of valued landscapes, because we've seen a number of appeal decisions that we've um, managed to win once we've refused applications in Fairham in our, what we call our strategic gaps. And this valued landscape is a term that the inspectors have used positively on a number of occasions. 
and that's suggesting that in the more rural parts that's of similar quality to areas of outstanding natural beauty and of course AONB is a landscape designation which the government advisor Natural England under the Countryside and Rights of Way Act it supports a presumption against major development so it, it could be that um, maybe if we don't achieve green belt that we could achieve AONB and that too would be a, a very valuable designation for us so Claire I don't know if you've got anything you'd like to add and then I see Keith's hand up next. Yeah just to compare I think uh, we've seen similar comments from the inspector so clearly the value of landscape is um, playing a significant role in decisions and certainly as we work through this piece of work around the value of the landscape potential green belt or other designations then it may well be that even if we cannot include green belt there may be designations that will ensure that we protect the special character of South Hampshire. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Keith. Keith Thanks, so much, Thanks so much, Sean. Um, I think it's rather helpful to have the presentation from CPRE this evening. Um, I didn't read anything into uh, the lack of content on in the report uh, on Greenbelt because the report is essentially a process one rather than a policy-based uh, report. But I think it is rather helpful. We've had this opportunity this evening to make some additional comments to reinforce the team drafting the core papers that uh, we do continue to support the direction that we set ourselves out in uh, all those months ago, uh, because it really is important. Uh, South Hampshire is polycentric. Uh, the network of cities, towns and villages uh, is really important. We are not a metropolis and we do not want to be a metropolis. Well, many of us are here because we don't want to be in a metropolis. We like our network of linked settlements uh, with green spaces between them. Uh, and formalising way of protecting some of those green spaces is, is, I think, if not for all of us, but certainly most of us, certainly for me, um, a, a very high priority. Um, we know that our residents across our communities uh, value these green gaps. We also know that sometimes um, the planning world is less than sympathetic. Um, Greenbelt is not a designation of, uh, of saying don't build anything. It's a designation of value of land um, and how, how important it is uh, to keep those green gaps between our settlements. Planning inspectors sometimes uh, have been known to say things that are not terribly supportive in this area. Uh, Eastley had a planning inspector recently that clearly didn't like strategic gaps or local gaps and wanted some other designation and wanted a further review to reduce them, uh, despite the fact the two previous inspectors had been more than happy. We are the democratic voice in South Hampshire and I think it's important that we continue to make our case Many other parts of the country have the benefit of green belt and still manage to achieve the development they need for their areas. Uh, and increasingly, that means they, they do look to density to make sure that they can maximise the green spaces that are left and value those green spaces. And I think that's the message that we're sending out. And I very much hope that colleagues will continue to give their support for green belt, green belt designation in South Hampshire. OK, thank you very much, Keith. Do you mind dropping your hand so you can fall back down the list? Done. Thank you very much. Anybody else have uh, anything they'd like to say or comment upon on that report? Okay, then unless anyone objects, I will take it that we note that report. I see a few nodding heads. So having done that, we will now move to the next item on the agenda, which is item nine, which is the Partnerships Coordinators Report. Uh, Paddy. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. So Paddy May, the, the push coordinator. Um, people re remember that there are, there are two parts to this report. There's the part A, which is the item for decisions, and part B, which is items for information. Um, in terms of part A for this report, <coughs> it relates to the, the business plan. Uh, members may remember that uh, last year we agreed that we would aim to have a medium-term plan that we would agree at this time uh, in this municipal year to sort of uh, go forward for the next five years. Um, the sort of pandemic uh, response from the local authorities has meant that it's not been possible to sort of develop that. Uh, and also, I think there's a concern when this was discussed at the PUSH Chief Executives meeting that actually uh, to try and set a medium term plan at this stage when it's not clear quite what the sort of context within which PUSH will be operating in the next few years is probably not entirely sensible. Uh, so on that basis, as a recommendation that we sort of roll the existing plan, one year plan forward for one more year with the idea that we then work up a medium term plan to bring back to this time next year. What we um, will then 
want to do is then report back as we always do through the d different areas of work streams uh, through the coordinators report going through the year uh, um, uh, and actually so, so fundamentally just rolling forward the priorities that are in the existing plan so that was the the part a which is the item for decision i don't know whether you want to deal with that with that one first or do the whole report okay. uh, perhaps we can do the whole report Thank yeah you. fine 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 uh, so part b is then the the item for information um, we, we have a request always to put in the sort of the bird aware data in terms of the uh, different um, levels of engagement through the website and different social media and so forth. So we, we're providing that. Um, there's been a decision has been made that the monitoring work for the fifth year should actually be uh, sort of paused for a year uh, on the basis that actually it's a very different year this year than we'd normally expect. So we wouldn't want to be making future decisions based on what's happening in this year. Uh, the site-specific projects, uh, we had £200,000 allocated for a project on Hailing Island. That's now not going forward, um, so that funding has been put back into the pot for future years for allocation for, for projects to support future site-specific projects. Uh, and then finally, there's an update from the Culture, Creative Industries and Built Environment talking about the uh, necessary engagement to try and help uh, different creative organisations um, through the, sort of the, the COVID response and, and the recovery element. And there's some update from Charles on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Paddy. So it's over to members now. And the first I would like to speak is uh, Councillor Steve Philpott from Gosport. Steve. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. And apologies, my, uh, my, I don't seem to have a hand raising facility on my computer, but the chat box seems to, to work perfectly well. Um, actually, following on from uh, from the last uh, report that we had on uh, on the statement of common ground, uh, I very much welcome the uh, business plan. I think it's an excellent document, and I'd like to commend it. And in particular, I draw the members' attention in, in what we were discussing just now. Actually, uh, in Appendix One, uh, Item Nine, that uh, it says um, Push will work together to identify how these housing requirements uh, can be met collectively. And I certainly welcome that. And uh, Gospel is more than willing to, to, to sit down with all partners in a business-like and constructive manner to work on these matters uh, in a collective uh, decision on housing. And Appendix 110, uh, which is uh, which is uh, something that uh, Keith, uh, Keith House was uh, saying just now, which I fully endorse. And it says, uh, adopting an evidence base to support a strong policy protection for strategic gaps. And uh, as far as Gosport, speaking on behalf of Gosport, I'd say we fully endorse the entire business plan, but I specifically wanted to raise those two points as being of great importance to us, and uh, we very much welcome it. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Steve. Anybody else want to speak on this report? Okay, well then I'll uh, take it that uh, unless there is any negative activity, I see that the, those recommendations are agreed. Nobody against? Okay, and that's done. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to item 10, which is our budget report. And I'm hoping we have Jonathan Evans present from Southampton City Council uh, to make any comment he would wish on this item. Jonathan. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, so I'm Jonathan Evans, Finance Business Partner at Southampton City Council. Um, the reason uh, for the report is that it shows um, the outturn position on the budget in 1920 seeks approval for the 1920 statement of accounts and also to approve the um, partnership budget for 2021 following approval of the interim budget in February. Um, in terms of the outturn position on the revenue budget, there was a slight underspend on the energy and green economy panel that was highlighted at the previous joint committee. Um, as a result of some projects no longer requiring the funding and also an underspend on the culture panel which was agreed to be carried forward in the February meeting. Um, on the capital budget there's the um, grant funding that's come from the le local growth deal. Those projects um, need to be completed by March um, 2021 so currently working with the uh, relevant project managers and the LEP to ensure that those deadlines are met. For the statement of accounts, um, these are the annual accounts. They've been produced on the same basis as uh, previous years, just showing the financial performance for 1920 
as well as the financial position at the 31st of March. These have been reviewed by the internal auditors and they haven't had any major findings. Uh, so finally, the 2021 budget reflects that was approved in February. The, co the partnership contributions for the year total 75,000 and they will cover the core costs. At the February meeting, um, approvals were granted to the culture panel for a base budget in 2021 of 13,000, the carry forward of 30,000, uh, and any other panel's uh, expenditure during the year would either need to be funded out of the unallocated balances or directly by partners on a uh, project by project basis. Um, so the three recommendations for the Joint Committee. One is to note the outturn for the financial year 1920. Two is to approve the statement of accounts for 1920. And three is to approve the proposed capital and revenue budgets for 2021. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. Uh, ask members, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to make? If so please signify now. I see none, so I'll put the recommendations to members A to C. Ask whether anybody wishes to object to those recommendations. It seem not, so I'll say that those recommendations are agreed by the Joint Committee. Thank you very much. That moves us on to item 11, which is the nitrates update. And we have with us David Bibby, who is the chairman of the Push Water Quality Working Group, and Graham Horton and Rachel Jones from Natural England. So I'll hand over to Dave to give a brief introduction, and then we'll look, I'm sure, in some detail at that report. So David Bibby. Um, thank you, Chairman, um, and I'm a Principal Planning Officer at Test Valley Borough Council, and as you indicated, I author the report as, as, as Chair of the Water Quality Working Group. Um, I've been asked before I start, please, to just refer to a comment uh, that Councillor Glass has made as Chair of the Urban Scrutiny Committee, that having read the report, he's pleased to see that nitrates mitigation is going ahead and looks forward to helping with local plans and furthering much needed housing. So um, the report provides a further summary update on progress since the February Joint Committee meeting and it, again it details the various work streams which are underway and the progress um, which has been made and is ongoing focusing on the key, key tasks and issues. Um, the water quality working groups continue to meet virtually on a regular basis working closely with the planning officers group and key stakeholders. Table one of the report on page 63 provides updated figures on the current backlog dwellings due to the nutrient issue. And appendix one to the report, which commences on page 72, provides an updated overview of the indi each individual authority's own mitigation solutions, which are currently they're currently using or investigation. This is outside of the collective work um, of the partnership. So the, the key issue for consideration is the proposed dedicated temporary planning officer post as a resource for the partnership to work um, and take work forward on the nutrient neutrality issue and take forward a pilot for a sub-regional mitigation scheme or what would become a solely nutrient fund and that will be initially for one year and this follows um, the agreement of the joint committee back in February to invest, investigate options for a dedicated post to work on the issue. Um, on page, table two on page 66 of the report details that we've secured agreement for funding from um, partnership members and other local authorities affected by the issue following David Williams's email request of the 15th of May um, to chief executives seeking funding support. That was first made to uh, the push local authorities and then it was also subsequently extended the other local authorities who are members of the Water Quality Working Group, so that's Basingstoke and Dean, Chichester, Isle of Wight and the South Downs National Park Authority. We're still awaiting a response from the Isle of Wight, but they were actually only invited to participate um, laterally, so it was just a subsequent request. Um, following the favourable responses, we should now be able to go ahead um, with, with recruiting for that position and the scope of the work um, for the post to undertake is setting out in paragraph 10 of the report and again as you can see in table 2 
um, we've also secured an in principle interest towards contributing funding towards the Solent Nutrient Fund as the sub regional mitigation solution. Um, and again, that's from members and other affected local authorities. And I understand it's the only reason haven't to sort of declined is because they have our own solution, which would make their needs uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, there's also the potential of a new bid to the Solent Let for a loan under the government's Getting Building Fund, where they're looking for shovel ready projects to assist uh, recovery. Um, and an expression of interest in that has been submitted. Um, crucially, both the pilot project and the social nutrient fund, when they've been worked up into mitigation schemes, will both require funding in order for them to be implemented. And if more funding is available, this would enable progress to be made more quickly and deliver a higher amount of mitigation than would otherwise be possible. So I'll just briefly cover my may the other work streams um, on other matters. So we've, we've continued ongoing engagement with government officials from both MHCLG and DEFRA working with um, Natural England and the Environment Agency. Um, they have been dialing into uh, planning officers group meetings and we've also had separate groups with key officers. Um, but again, at, at the governmental level, progress has obviously been affected by um, coronavirus due to financial and other priorities. Um, Natural England held meetings with local members of parliament on the 15th of May and on the 26th of June. Um, the the Natural England advised on the base of mitigation proposals that they are aware of or where advice has been sought. Um, this could provide potential offsetting for a lower estimate of around 37,000 dwellings. However, it should be noted that that's an indicative figure and the mitigation which is suggested that comprises that figure might not all proceed and, and maybe it's based on the inquiries that may or may not take place and they may or may not be related to current planning applications which the local authority is aware of. So we, the local authorities don't have a more detailed breakdown, um, so there are issues regarding deliverability and availability over time, but it does demonstrate that there is a significant potential level of mitigation that could become available. Um, we've had an updated advice um, and me methodology from Natural England in March, and that was accompanied by non-technical summary, uh, which is more easy for laymen and small-scale developers um, and landowners to understand, and also a nutrient budget tool, uh, which allows you to calculate through Excel in a, in a relatively easy way. Uh, the key changes to methodology are um, an acceptable total nitrogen loading of two milligrams per litre, which can be subtracted from um, the nutrient budgets of development, there's a new methodology for package treatment plants where a development would use non-mains drainage and further information on the location of mitigation landing, essentially in regard to which catchment area um, the mitigation can be located vis-a-vis -vis the development site's location. Uh, and then there was a further check as minor amendments were made to the advice in June, uh, which were further minor points of revision and clarification. The work on the wastewater treatment permit review uh, discussions about whether that would go ahead, those were taking place uh, between Natural England and the Environment Agency, but unfortunately again because of the coronavirus um, they've been put on hold as the Environment Agencies have to prioritise their critical responsibilities, um, but we do hope there will be a decision on how to go ahead with that after the next couple of weeks, and the Environment Agency is also modelling uh, work on the updated sources of nutrients and the source apportionment um, and they're very supportive of green recovery and the green recovery including natural capital. Um, Southern Water from April has started the voluntary monitoring of nitrogen discharges from the smaller wastewater treatment works and the larger ones which don't have currently have a permit limit um, but we'll need to wait uh, probably up to, up to a year um, for a relatively robust data stream of that data to be available, but in due course it will allow comparison with the assumed 25 milligrams per litre in the methodology uh, where works don't currently have uh, a permit limit. Uh, work on the integrated water management, so the addendum update continues, um, and again that's in light of the updated natural England advice and methodology, and further work is now also being undertaken where ammonium can be used as a proxy for nitrogen, again, where we don't have a permit limit or, or sufficient data. And then finally, on the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust Mitigation Scheme, 
further progress is being made developing that scheme and implementing it and the first site on the Isle of Wight has now been purchased I understand that the credits have all been sold or reserved and the trust is continuing to make progress with negotiation of a number of further sites um, throughout the South Hampshire area and discussions are also continuing again how on how the proposed mitigation is most appropriately secured alongside planning commission including legal mechanisms um, where the location is within a different local authority with a view to seeking uh, the principle of a common approach and in the longer term it's likely that a suite of, mitigate, a suite of mitigation measures will be used of which the Hampshire Mile of Wild, Wildlife Trust will be one under the proposed solar nutrient fund as the strategic solution. So the recommendations of the report are to endorse the establishment of the dedicated offer resource, resource as a temporary post to work on the issue and take forward the pilot and also to endorse the continuing investigation of the sub-regional scheme which would move towards a solar nutrient fund and also to endorse um, we continue to work with partners beyond the partnership um, it's essentially the local authorities in assessing the issue and including on potential funding and then it notes and to note that uh, we continue to seek funding options for alternative funding and also that we continue to work with government departments again on seeking solutions on seeking their support thank you chairman thank, thank you very much indeed david can i just see whether anything is to be added by graham or rachel from natural england anything either of you would like to say yeah thank you chairman it's graham horton from natural england um just to add a, a further a couple of points so we as david said we met with the mps uh, 10 local MPs on the 26th of June. Um, at their request, they've invited Natural England to write to them to set out what extra support uh, would be needed to unblock some of the, the issues around land acquisition and what funds uh, could go towards. So we've, we've sent that letter off this week with the aim that the MPs will be able to use that letter in discussions with Treasury to point out um, the need to get things moving. We've also written a supportive letter to the Solent Lep this week to uh, highlight again our support for the need to find some funds to enable the land mitigation to come forward. And we hope that uh, these letters will, will uh, show our support for these schemes to come forward. Um, and one final point, if I may. Um, uh, David also mentioned the, the, the number of mitigation options that we have um, been approached about. Uh, if that's a, a useful thing that the committee would like to see, I can I, we can provide a copy of that and provide regular updates so members and um, members can see the amount of uh, mitigation pipeline that we've got in the pipeline, and um, and that might give some sort of reassurance about the, the kind of approaches that we've been uh, have received uh, today. Well, that would be really useful. Thank you, Graham. If you could get something to me, and I'll make sure it goes out to all of the joint committee members. Okay, uh, Rachel Jones, anything from you? Um, no, no further points from me, thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Okay, then we'll move um, to members now. In, in terms of, obviously, I'm sure we're all delighted that our members of Parliament are now taking an interest in this matter. Uh, I did meet some months, several months ago now, Robert Jenrick and put a proposal to him, which we discussed at push meetings previously and that was that these large fines that have been levied on our major polluter uh, which while agriculture is a major polluter but um, southern water is a major polluter uh, that those fines would reasonably be used for mitigation for us to then be able to purchase the appropriate mitigation land and hold it and nurture it and rewild it over many years I'm still waiting for a reply to that. Now, I realise Natural England isn't part of MHCLG, but if you are able to chivy any colleagues in MHCLG, it would be good for us to hear back because Southern Water has very recently held its hands up to more pollution incidents in the Solent, and there's going to be another big fine, and we could very usefully use that money. And I think it would make more sense for us to be able to purchase land in mitigation um, just to rebate some southern water bill payers who probably didn't realise that they'd ever been wronged in the first place. So that would be helpful. 
Uh, and I'm probably only a thing I was going to mention before I bring in members, and I've got so far Stephen Philpock from Gosport and Nick Adams King from Test Valley. Uh, just to say that, and the report does refer to it, but there has been some very, very good work has gone on with the Hampshire Art Wild Wildlife Trust. And I know that to, to some people look a bit askance and say, well, why are they helping development? Well, what they're actually doing is helping in bringing back very poor agricultural land, which takes a massive nutrient, artificial nutrient addition to make it in any way productive and rewilding that land and reducing the nutrient outflows from it as well. So I think it fits very, very well with their charitable objectives, although I know there are those that would suggest otherwise. So we are very grateful indeed to the work that Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust have been able to do, and indeed the support from Natural England in being able to bring forward those um, mitigation measures. And I know that there is going to be a legal agreement signed very shortly between the Trust and Ferrenborough Council and the Isle of Wight Council, which I know will then be very useful to all servant authorities who are then very welcome to make use of it themselves because all of the work will have been done uh, and it's something which will see land maintained and rewilded and looked after for 125 years as a minimum and paid for by the developers and it will have the effect of reducing the nutrient flow into the solent as well, so very positive. Going to move now to Steve Philpott. Yeah, so thank you, Chairman. I'm, I, I hope uh, members won't mind if, uh, if they indulge me just for a few moments. Well, I just, I've just got a few points I wanted to make on, on, this, uh, on this item. I have some concerns and, uh, and questions about the approach that we're being asked to adopt. So firstly, I note that this report includes the word mitigation 39 times. Uh, so it's clear in the report that, uh, that mitigation is, uh, is a means to achieve nutrient neutrality, of course. And the uh, suggestion is that uh, this can be achieved through an offset credit scheme. I wanted to satisfy myself that uh, what was meant by, by mitigation within the uh, context of the Habitats Directive and the, uh, and the Conservation of Habitats and Species Regulations 2017. So I spent a while reading them. Uh, so I, no, I won't get that time back, uh, but it, was, uh, but it, was, it was, uh, took me a while and it was very interesting. The Habitats Regulations actually describe mitigation, for instance, as the aim to minimize or even cancel negative impacts on the site itself. Article 6.1 of the Habitats Directive uh, commits uh, responsible authorities uh, to restore or maintain natural habitats and species at favorable status. Uh, natural England's advice uh, to this joint committee on the 31st of July last year, members might recall, said, and I quote, Evidence has identified that some designated sites are in unfavorable condition due to existing levels of nutrients. Uh, and bearing in mind that Natural England also went on to say, uh, it is Natural England's view that there is likely significant effect on the internationally designated sites due to inc the increase in wastewater from the new developments coming forward. Uh, it would seem to me that the intention of the, uh, of the mitigation scheme proposed is to maintain the habitats of their existing unfavorable status. That I would suggest is not mitigation and it could even potentially be a breach of the habitat regulations. Uh, in fact, what's being proposed appears to be compensation and the definition of compensation in the habitats regulation is, uh, and I quote from it again, independent of the project, they are intended to compensate for the effects on a habitat affected negatively by the plan or project, being, say, house building, for instance. But actually, it matters little whether it's compensation or mitigation. There is still an obligation on the, uh, on the authority to, uh, to uh, preserve uh, conservation areas, uh, conservation sites at favorable status or to restore them to a favorable status. I note paragraph 21 of this report says that there have been, uh, it says, significant revisions to Natural England's advice. And uh, though the report gives a very brief summary of the significant changes uh, that we've, uh, we haven't been given uh, a copy, 
and uh, we were given a copy of Natural England's guidance in July last year, uh, but nothing since uh, from from them as far as guidance, the guidance is concerned. So it would be interesting to see the update. Paragraph seven of this report confirms that no government agency is prepared to put up the money to uh, to lend to the wildlife trust. And the reason given in paragraph seven is uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Actually, this is a red herring, uh, as we understand. There's, there's no government agency was prepared to hand over any money anyway before the pandemic. And I know that because uh, they told me. Uh, so as, uh, as per the recommendations, it's now up to us then to come up with the money for a dedicated officer and a sub-regional mitigation pilot scheme. My concern is that the, the arrangement that's been negotiated between Natural England and the Wildlife Trust may potentially not be lawful. Uh, the planning inspector's decision for September Cottage last week uh, actually really uh, high, heightens my concern. So in conclusion, Chairman, can I say, I, I think as an absolute minimum, we should insist on seeing the latest Natural England advice and their legal advice uh, before, we are, uh, we, before we decide to agree to anything. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Steve, for that. Uh, I will ask Natural England to comment at this point on that, and I would say that I don't know if you have seen it, but I did write a letter which I copied to you, Steve, and to all members about September Cottage, which is a, is a development which was applied for in Fairham, refused in Fairham, and twice refused by appeal inspectors in Fairham. And it's something that Fairham is perfectly happy with this mitigation scheme. Uh, in, ter and in terms of what the inspector said, which was talking about a scheme which at that time didn't exist. Uh, our solicitors are very happy with what is proposed, and I know Natural England is too, but uh, Graham or Rachel, please do, because it's a very important point that Steve makes. And of course, it is important that we know that we're signing up to something which is legally watertight. So would, would one of you like to comment on this, or, or both of you? Yes, sure, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, and thank you, Councillor, uh, for your questions. Um, so, first of all, the, um, the our advice is available on the PUSH website, but I can provide it to you if you'd like to see it. Um, and you said you have, so I can provide that with you. Um, we're confident that the uh, the schemes such as the Wildlife Trust do constitute mitigation rather than compensation, because they prevent harm from occurring to the designated sites. Um, I'd be happy to pick that up separately to, to go through some of the finer points if that, that's useful, but we, we have considered it internally and we are, as Councillor Woodward has um, suggested, confident that, that what we've done is, is, is right. Um, there is a, a, a wider requirement, as, as the Councillor identifies, under Article 6.1 for us to restore the sites to favourable conservation status. Um, that's a UK government uh, objective and there's a separate area of work not described in, in the paper submitted that's just starting to look at the wider reforms that might be needed to get the site into favourable condition and is looking at some of the wider agricultural issues and other sources of nutrients that are causing um, the decline of the, the current situation in terms of unfavourability of the site. What we have to do here is under Article 6.3 is make it when local authorities are determining the effects from new housing is decide whether it will, uh, whether the permitting that new housing will make the issue worse and have a likely significant effect. Um, based on the, the mitigation schemes that we've um, we've worked on alongside the Wildlife Trust and and and, and Fair and Borough Council, we we feel uh, confident that uh, there won't be an, uh, an adverse effect or a requirement for compensation because those impacts are mitigated. Okay, thank you for that. And I could also make clear as well, because of course this is fair and we're talking about with this first scheme, is that this scheme doesn't isn't neutral. It isn't just achieving neutrality, it's actually reducing pollution and the calculations which the Wildlife Trust have put together in conjunction with Fairham, the Isle of Wight and Natural England is built headroom into those calculations. So we're actually looking at reducing pollution and therefore the potential to improve those special um, protected sites so it isn't just to hold the line it is actually 
bringing about improvements and that is important. I think the other thing that's probably important for people to be aware of in terms of the agreement as well is that the trust will not be selling nitrate credits to developers who are in receipt of refusals of planning application, um, planning applications from the local planning authority and then at appeal. So while one particular development has been mentioned this evening, that will not be in receipt of credits um, from this scheme because it does not accord with Fair and Borough Council's local plan. Right, uh, and Nick Adams King, next please, from Tusk Valley. Uh, yes, thanks. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you said some of what I wanted to say actually a little early on. Um, I, I just wanted to um, uh, support uh, the, the creation of this officer post. Um, I know how much work David has put into. Uh, this issue over the last few months, uh, not least as I'm the planning portfolio holder in Test Valley as well. Um, but uh, he and his group have done a fantastic amount of work, but it is a very big issue for us, and particularly as we take these mitigation schemes forward, um, then I, I would encourage my colleagues to um, endorse the creation of the, the post um, and, and to thank David and his colleagues for all of their hard work to this point. And I know that will, the creation of the post will take some of the pressure off of them. Um, I think as well, um, thank you for your clarification in, in the email that you sent us all this afternoon around the uh, September cottage issue. Um, I'm not sure that everyone has seen uh, a helpful email from the Hampshire Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust as well, which might also answer some of the uh, uh, concerns um, that uh, Councillor Philpott was mentioning a few minutes ago as well. Um, but also thanks to you for forging the way because with the creation of the uh, uh, of the scheme between Fairham and Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust, we create a framework to which we can all work as we go forward. And uh, I know there are quite a number of um, sites that we're, we're all looking at to provide that kind of mitigation for each of our, um, uh, each of our boroughs and, and districts. Um, uh, I also w would equally suggest that we, we support the um, application to the Solent LEP for funding. Um, you know, we, we need to uh, make sure that we have the funding in place to buy the land. And the, the question, the one question I have is that given that there are now within this group of authorities, four of us who are in the EM3 LEP, whether we should also be talking to them about uh, a source of funding as well in the same way that uh, we have done with the Solent NEP. Um, so just I, I leave that with um, colleagues and, and perhaps the planning officer group to, to think about and to uh, decide whether that's a, a way forward to do. Um, and finally, thank you also, um, Graham, for the offer of uh, the different mitigation schemes that English uh, Nature have been considering. Um, that I think would be useful for all of us to look at, not least when we're dealing with inquiries from members of the public and from uh, developers and builders ourselves in each of our different districts. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank, thank you very much indeed, Nick. Are there any other members that um, would like to ask any questions or make any comments on this before I bring back um, Steve Philpott who wants to respond? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody else. Steve? Uh, that's very kind. Thank you, Chairman. A um, couple of points, actually. I just want to clarify, if I could, with Mr. Horton. Um, Mr. Horton, you were mentioning about uh, about the, the significant uh, effects, and uh, and you were you seem to be rowing back on on Natural England's report from from last year. Uh, have have Natural England changed their minds? I mean, this is a uh, you will know from uh, from the habitats uh, regulations that this is a likely significant effect and not a certain significant effects. So in your report of last year and your advice of last year to us as councillors, you said uh, that it's Natural England's view that there is a likely significant effect. Uh, so I want to clarify with you that you are accepting that there is a likely significant effect on in terms of house building uh, and that you haven't in fact changed your minds. And if you have changed your minds, when and what evidence did you have to make you change your mind? That would be interesting to know. The, the second thing uh, relates to uh, to the issue of whether this is mitigation or compensation. And as I mentioned, it, it really matters not not greatly whether it is or, or is not. But words like uh, mitigation themselves or offset, which is uh, you know, and nutrient neutrality, uh, you know, the offset credits nutrient neutrality and so on. 
This is very much the language and very much the intention of maintenance and not restoration. Now, if you say, if you say, and the, and I hear you do say this still, and it is still the view of Natural England that that these habitats are in an unfavourable condition at present, then words like neutrality and offset credits and mitigation merely serve to, to, to confirm that the policy is to maintain the status quo, i.e. to maintain these habitats in their present unfavourable status. And yet the, the, the habitats regulations put an obligation on us as local authorities to restore habitats that are in an unfavourable condition and or to maintain habitats that are in a favourable condition. How do you manage to square the circle with, with this? I mean, I, I've got a problem with it and that problem isn't, isn't actually going away, I'm afraid. So I just wondered if you might be able to help me. Craig, Graham, would you like to comment on that? Yeah. I do think I've made clear already, Steve, that certainly where the Hampshire and Arnold White Trust scheme is concerned, it is not just mitigation, it is not neutrality, it is positive, it is less nutrients are going to be in the ecosystem, in the solvent, as a result of this scheme with the development than there would have been before. So that's a positive, it's not neutral. The prone. Yeah, that's correct, um, Chair. I, I'd also add that there is, there are a few other strands of work that are looking at um, helping the site get to be restored to favourable condition and, and one of those is predominantly looking at agricultural reform which is the main cause main source of nutrients that come into the solent and we're working with government colleagues to look at how we can reform the agricultural sector so that those uh, nutrients that are applied to agricultural land uh, are applied more sensitively and more targeted way so that if we can reduce the bulk of the nutrients coming in, that should help to restore, that should move the site towards um, uh, restoration. In the meantime, what we have to do here is consider the impacts from a specific scheme. And as, uh, as the chair's outlined, we think that using the Wildlife Trust scheme, we can make sure that those scheme impacts are mitigated. And indeed, there's a little bit of nutrient credit headroom as well to ensure it has a positive contribution. And if I may come back to the point about likely significant effect, I'm sorry if I added to confusion. So our advice is still that um, housing will have a likely significant effect. We believe that the mitigation schemes such as the wildlife trusts will prevent that housing from having an adverse effect because through the process of delivering nutrient neutrality, you prevent um, the site from deteriorating further. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Graham. Uh, I've also got um, Brian Johnson, who's the chairman of the Solent Local Enterprise Partnership, who would like to make a comment now. Brian. Thank you, Sean. I just wanted to make a comment that, that the comment that was made about um, should you be talking to EM3, we're having active conversations at the moment with all of the South East LEPs, but it occurs to me that, that I guess by the very definition of this, that the water doesn't really follow LEP boundaries. So it's probably something that we should discuss on that call with not just EM3, but Coast to Capital too, because that comes out in Chichester Harbour. So we, we're having conversations every fortnight. So rather than, what, what I'm suggesting is that they may well have some funding, but rather than put in a separate application, if it's helpful, I'll bring up the conversation at the next joint chairs meeting and say, is there any way we can do this collaboratively to make sense of it? rather than you having to manage the interface with several LEPs. Okay, thank you. That would be really helpful, Brian. Thank you for that. Right, I'd like to turn now then, please, to the recommendations. Not seeing any other hands up. So those recommendations come after, it's come on page 71. And what we're being asked to agree is to endorse the establishment of a dedicated officer resource as a temporary planning officer to work on nutrient neutrality to endorse continued investigation into determining a sub-regional mitigation scheme, endorsing Bush's continued work with wider local authority partners beyond the Bush boundaries, of course that's Basingstoke, etc., and noting that we continue to seek options for mitigation, 
and noting that we continue to work closely with MHCRG and DEFRA to find solutions and seek support to assist in achieving these. So that's what we're being asked to agree. I see anyone that does not wish to agree with those recommendations. I'm not. So those, those recommendations are agreed. So that brings us now to item 13, which is the schedule of meetings. Uh, that I think is probably doesn't need to be commented upon. They, they are there. Uh, and I hope that the committee agrees those. I don't see any non-agreement. So therefore I bring the meeting to a conclusion and thank everybody very much for their participation this evening. And I hope that uh, you all have a good evening. So thank you very so much. Castle Woodward, Castle Thanks. Woodward. Castle Woodward, we have the presentation. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's because I haven't got the agenda in front of me. Okay, well, we've dealt with the schedule of meetings. I'll now move backwards one. And I'm very sorry to both Simon and to John in my hurry to end proceedings. Uh, now, we have a presentation now by the Southern Policy Centre, uh, which is an organisation I've had a bit to do with over the last uh, couple of years. So we've been talking about uh, the uh, South and the Central South and uh, I know they've got some very useful things to say. So, John, if I can bring you in now, please. I'm Simon Eaton. Chair, thank you very much indeed. You had us on the ed edge of our seats <laughs> there for the moment. Um, I'm just uh, hoping, just trying to get the... So I, I, as usual, have messed up the technology, but just go onto the screen share. Um, right. I hope that's showing on your screens. Please tell me if it if it isn't. Um, so the Southern Policy Centre has been running now as an independent think tank for four and a half years. And one of the issues that we've looked at all through this time has been about regional strategy and uh, also the devolution debate. The work that we've done over the last year or so on whether there's a strategy for the Central South was prompted to us by a couple of groups of people. One was businesses who worried that we were losing out because we didn't have a strong brand which was recognised by government or investors, and also by comments from Lord Jim O'Neill, the uh, former devolution minister, that the earlier devolution bids from this part of the world didn't have a sufficiently strong central selling point. There are, of course, a number of reasons why one might look at a region rather than individual local authorities. Uh, one was certainly that government over recent years has wanted to devolve powers and resources to larger regions than most local authorities or areas with a strategic identity. It's useful to promote the region to potential investors. Arguably, on some issues, and you've just been discussing one, if I might say, working over a larger area makes policy implementation more effective and certainly there's potentially a more powerful voice to influence the national debates and that idea of having a, a regional focus also seems to make sense with the renewed commitment from the current government to English devolution uh, the promise of giving every part of the country to, the power to shape its future but also there's a focus on city regions and strategic growth coming through from the government, like the West Midlands, like the Oxcam Corridor. And of course, we do face here a focus on levelling up to the Midlands and the North. So there's a question of how do we make sure that the Central South does not look out? So we started not by trying to write a strategy, that's not our role, but we said, if we look at the published plans of top tier authorities, LEPs, Partnership for South Hampshire, National Parks, and put them together, do these amount to a regional strategy? And that was the question we asked. And by the way, none of this work is about boundary changes or reorganization. This was trying to look at underlying messages and strategies. Well, when we looked at those published documents about a year ago, at first sight, you'd have to say there didn't seem to be a particularly strong regional message. Uh, there was no presentation of a common narrative. The different strategy documents didn't reinforce shared ambitions. There was little acknowledgement of shared challenges and only occasional recognition of the importance of collaboration. But 
when we look below the headlines at the content and the analysis of the documents that have been published by many different public bodies, quite a different picture began to emerge. The first was that there were very clear economic synergies across the Central South in key sectors of the economy and also in key enabling technologies. We've got real strengths in these areas right across uh, this part of the world. So we have economic synergies. Secondly, when people set out their challenges, these were also pretty widely shared. There are concerns about productivity, about economic growth rates, growing and attracting high performance business and the need to improve skill levels. So none of these are particular problems for particular authorities or economic areas. They are shared challenges. We talk about the region in very similar ways and particularly as a gateway. So the two ports, the airport, our road and rail links, our connections to other parts of the UK, to Europe and the world are seen as assets by every single organisation that has produced some sort of strategy for any part of this region. And when we look below that, we find very similar approaches. So if you look at the major city region areas, the sort of solutions people are advocating to local transport challenges are very similar. And across the region, there are a number of key corridors, key investments, which are really shared priorities that benefit everybody in this part of the world. Another common theme coming through all the strategies is a recognition of the extraordinary natural environment in which our economy sits. Two national parks, uh, areas of outstanding national beauty, heritage, countryside and coastline right across the region seen as assets and not just as uh, assets for well-being and for good places to live but as economic assets as well. Looking further at strategy documents, though these things don't come out often as much as we would like in, across the region, the same things come up again. We have six strong universities which in their strengths really complement each other every bit as much as they compete with each other. We have a strong cultural offer. Some of this I have to say was written pre-COVID and the problems of some of our theatres, but that will come back. We have a good heritage offer, strong tourism as well. And when we looked at the aspirations of strategy documents across the region, again, it was the same issues that were coming out time and time again. Uh, the need for uh, green, uh, green uh, decarbonisation of energy supply, the whole range of challenges to do with climate change and now a green recovery, the need to tackle problems of a housing and affordability and the desire to uh, develop further the tourist economy. And finally, really a strong sense of place. Uh, the three waterfront cities are quite distinct in the way that they work together, but also see themselves as waterfront cities. But beyond the cities, a recognition in most of the strategy documents that there's actually a complementary relationship between the urban areas and the rural areas. The rural areas can't thrive without the urban areas succeeding and unless the urban areas succeed and are good, good places to live, then the pressures on rural areas become unmanageable. So when we looked at the documents in the round and despite the lack of headline messages shared across them, we began to feel there was a narrative for somewhere we can describe as the Central South. It has three waterfront cities with complementary economies and ambitions. It has six strong universities. It has a large and potentially interconnected population, perhaps as many as two million people, which would make it the second or third largest local authority area if it worked together as a region, although I'm not getting to organisation issues. We have a strong cultural offer. We have a wonderful natural environment. We're a gateway region with great connectivity to the southwest, to northeast Hampshire, Surrey and the Thames Valley and to London. And perhaps we have a story here that is a good fit to emerging government priorities and the type of region that they said they wanted to invest in. So the map 
looks something like this. It has deliberately fuzzy boundaries. It doesn't have a sharp definition to it. And what makes sense as a region does vary according to the issue you look at. But nonetheless, I think it's a part of the world that we would all recognize that we live in. So what would the next steps be? Well, our suggestion, and that's just us as a think tank, if people find this idea attractive, and the idea here is to build on what people are already doing. It's not an approach that requires any organization within the region to change its approach or change its policy. The next step might be to develop this shared narrative so that it's used more widely. And already we're beginning to see some business groups using Central South as a descriptor of the region. It was the title used for the public-private sector partnership that was due to go to the MIPIN uh, property conference, which got cancelled because of the pandemic. It's being used by some universities. So it's beginning to enter the language of people in the region. A second area of work, and this of course is something where partnership for South Hampshire has been doing this for many years before we ever got involved in the discussion, determining common priorities across a wide range of issues. Then perhaps, and again, partnership for South Hampshire has shown the way here, extending cooperation across individual authorities and bodies in planning and transport, in energy supply, the greening of energy and the visitor economy. And we would suggest that it would be useful if in parallel to what um, public sector bodies do in collaboration, if there were other regional networks. And there are already the beginning of um, putative discussions in higher education, in further education, to work more clearly at a regional level across the creative industries, and also developing some of the ideas around uh, green recovery across some public sector bodies and industry bodies. So, shared colleagues, uh, thank you for your time in that. Um, Dr. Simon Eden's also on the call here with me. But I hope that gives you some idea of, of the idea of the Central South that we think already exists within the strategies that many different organizations are putting forward and would suggest as a think tank that this is worth discussing and possibly uh, taking forward. But I'd be very happy to listen to the discussion and answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much indeed, John. That was really interesting. Uh, Simon, is there anything you wanted to add? I'll just move to any members' comments. Uh, thank you, Chair. Nothing to add beyond the delight of after four years being back as a partnership for South Hampshire meeting. <laughs> right, okay then. So, any members, anybody wishing to make any comment, start any discussion, ask any questions? It seems not. Oh, no, I'm wrong. Michael, Michael Wilson from Havant. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I suppose that the there are a lot of these discussions going on at the moment uh, at Hampshire level, uh, more local level, um, about an identity for the South. Obviously, we, we have this discussion with the LEP. Um, but I suppose that behind it is, is, is what is the driver. The last time we were talking in terms of sort of devolution, it was definitely a treasury-led uh, matter, and I think we probably need to make sure that if we do go down this sort of route looking for a common identity, we're doing it for the right reasons, and, and then hopefully it will uh, fr uh, provide the, the fruit we're looking for. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Michael. Anybody else? Right, okay. Well, it remains then for me to thank John and Simon for taking time out this evening and updating us on this. I know there's another conference um, which I know I'm joining in the next day or two. I think it's in my diary. So thank you for keeping momentum going on these discussions about our shared interests and shared aspirations across the Central South area. Um, I'm sure we'll be welcoming you back again to talk further, uh, John. So sure. thank you. Is, is it possible if I could just put in a quick plug for anybody who might be interested for the conference that you're joining us on on Thursday. Um, we have a, a seminar on Thursday morning at 10 o'clock uh, looking more specifically at the government's devolution white paper and what it might say, um, including uh, Nick Long, who is the special advisor to Sajid Javid uh, when he was at Communities and Local Government. So if any colleagues were 
interested in joining that, it should be a very pro productive discussion. So th thank you for the plug. And you can easily contact me and we can give you registration details. Okay, thank, thank you, Sean. Keith, you Yeah, thanks, Sean. And uh, first of all, my apologies to, to, to John and to Simon for not making the recent series of events. And I can't make Thursday either, unfortunately, just through all these Zoom and Teams meetings that permanently eat up our lives now. Um, but I just think that there might be a role for the Southern Policy Centre over the course of the next few months as we not just think about devolution, but also the uh, the heavily rumoured and trailed uh, suggestions from from government uh, on uh, on reorganisation of local government, um, because you know, we will all have our own views. Uh, I'm sure most of them are fairly strongly held for different reasons. Uh, but some some uh, some additional commentary uh, from local friends uh, might not be a bad thing as part of that discussion. Well. We, if I may, Chair, we're, we're always willing, we, we describe ourselves as providing a neutral and critical space so that people can come together on neutral ground, not in somebody else's territory to discuss these issues. And we had a very successful series of seminars looking at recovery in the Central South over the last um, four weeks. And I think um, we are more than happy to do that. It would go beyond our remit to start producing proposals as to exactly how the local authorities might want to respond to devolution. I think that 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 lies, I, I think, in the responsibility of those of you on the call who are elected and properly constituted people. But we'd be very happy to prescribe to, to try to provide the space, as we're trying to do on Thursday, where these discussions can take place with no axe to grind. Okay, thank you very much, John. If you'd like to. Uh, drop a note or a link to our uh, committee clerk, Astra, who convened the meeting, then I'm sure we should be able to send it out to the attendees today, in case everybody is able to join us on Thursday. Okay, well, now we really are at the end, so thank you very much indeed. I hope you all take care and I look forward to seeing you before too long, maybe physically in due course as well. So thank you very much indeed, and I declare this meeting closed. Goodbye, Joel. Bye.